Hey everyone, Dr. Whitney Coster is here to ask you how you think your day, your week, or even your life may be changed by watching this video and listening to my lecture on Ray Bradbury's 1952 short story, A Sound of Thunder. Now, this may seem like a dramatic question, but I ask it because A Sound of Thunder considers the butterfly effect, a term scientifically proven and coined 10 years after the story's publication. Yeah, read Bradbury and basically watch him eerily predict the consequences of the present day. So back to my question. How could watching this video impact you long term? Well, the butterfly effect is the notion that a minuscule or seemingly insignificant choice that we make can ultimately have a dramatic impact on our lives. So let's say you watch this lecture, which motivates you to read more of Bradbury's works, and you find that you enjoy his literature so much that you decide to become an English major, and this leads you to applying to colleges known for their specialty in contemporary American literature, and in the program, you meet your person, and here you are, just having accidentally clicked on my video when you were really looking for tutorials on how to make guacamole. Well, you're here, so you should watch and subscribe to the channel just in case you're interested in the analyses and explanation of classic literature as well as help with writing and rhetoric. You never know how it might impact your life. So I know that I might sound a little arrogant here, but I'm actually quite serious. A Sound of Thunder suggests that any decision we make may have a greater impact later on down the road. Since this is one of the main points of the story, let's take a look at our protagonist, Eccles, and the choices that he makes. So who are we dealing with here? Eccles is arrogant, wealthy, inquisitive, and ambitious. His eyes are bigger than his stomach. Recreational big game hunting is for the rich and has always been a marker of wealth and status. This is one reason hunters display their kill on walls. It shows off their dominance, wealth, power, status, and the opportunities that they have been afforded. If you are familiar with Walter Palmer, the Minnesotan who hunted Cecil the Lion in Africa, you'll know that he paid approximately $50,000 for his hunting license. That is a considerable amount of money for a hobby. And the bigger the game, the bigger the hunter's bragging rights. So consider this. Time Safari offers its clientele the opportunity to hunt down any animal ever to have existed on planet Earth. And what does Eccles choose to hunt? The T-Rex, the king of the dinosaurs. Even though the T-Rex wasn't the biggest dinosaur ever to have existed, it has certainly captured the greatness and the monstrosity of dinosaurs in the popular consciousness. And this is confirmed by the man behind the desk when he says the T-Rex is the tyrant lizard, the most incredible monster in history. So what does it tell you about Eccles' character that he wants to kill the greatest, biggest, most spectacular animal of all time? At first glance, Eccles certainly comes off as an obnoxious guy who gets his comeuppance at the end of the story. I mean, this is a guy who wants to hunt down the greatest animal of all time and be envied by other hunters, and yet seems to know very little about the safari that he's about to embark on. In fact, the moment he pays his $10,000 fee to the company, he asks, does the safari guarantee that I come back alive? Now, think about the amount of information that all businesses give you when they provide you with a service. I personally think of the four pages that I had to read through and sign in order for my kids to play at an indoor playground. My point is that this is an incredible risk that Eccles is taking. He's gambling with his life and risking time, space, and history. Who knows where he'll actually go and if he'll return to the present. I mean, if this were you, wouldn't you have read up on this company and asked for reviews and more information before handing over your 10K? Wouldn't you have asked how the time machine works? Basically, wouldn't you want to know the ins and outs of everything before committing. And even when the man behind the desk says that the company is not responsible if anything happens to Eccles, Eccles simply remains silent, too focused on traveling to the past. Clearly, he's in it for the personal gain and not for the safety or other logistics of the adventure. So you might say he gets what he deserves. After all, he didn't do his homework and he didn't really care. In the end, you could argue that Eccles got shot, and his arrogance made the world worse than it would have been since, as we later learn, the American Democratic humanitarian Keith has been replaced by his rival Deutscher, a name that I think is very deliberate on Bradbury's part. Deutscher means a person of German descent, anything but American. It's reminiscent of a Hitler figure, and remember that this story was published in 1952, only a few years after the end of World War II. We're told that Deutscher is a militarist, an antichrist, an anti-human, an anti-intellectual, that no one wants to be around if he actually wins the election. And yet, here he is, as president in the new version of the world. The real question of the story is, I think, whether Eccles is truly responsible for this or not. Now, what sort of responsibility does the company actually shoulder and show? Consider the gravity of this service that they're offering. 
Every time they take a client to a different part of time and space, they risk a very real possibility of compromising the world, history, everything as we know it, and they do it for the money, acknowledging that even the government has vocalized major concerns about their business. As Travis and Eccles are traveling back into time, Travis tries to explain the gravity of the situation. He says, Christ isn't born yet. Moses has not gone to the mountains to talk to God. The pyramids are still in the earth waiting to be cut out and put up. Remember that. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, none of them exists. Directly after telling Eccles this information, he introduces him to the path. Now, why Eccles hasn't been informed of this path prior to getting into the time machine is bewildering and so irresponsible on the company's part. He's told the path floats six inches above the earth. It doesn't touch one blade of grass, flower, or tree. It's anti-gravity metal. Its purpose is to keep you from touching the world of the past in any way. Stay on the path. Don't go off for any reason. If you fall off, there's a penalty. And don't shoot any animal we don't okay. Travis explains, this rule is set in place because we don't want to change the future. We don't belong here in the past. The government doesn't like us, and we have to pay a big graph to keep our franchise. A time machine is finicky business. Not knowing it, we might kill an important animal, a small bird, a roach, a flower even. That's destroying an important link in a growing species. Travis then goes on to explain the chain of events that may seem insignificant event by event, but ultimately lead to a massive change in events that have significantly impacted our world, such as the existence of ancient Rome, the modernization of Europe, or even the possibility of the United States existing. Travis even admits that they are not quite sure if time can be changed by them, that this is all a theory. He says, we don't know, we're guessing, but until we do know if our messing around in time can make a big roar or a little wrestle in history, we're being careful. So that's good, I guess, but clearly the company is playing with fire for the sake of profit. To further question the company's culpability, we have to ask why the path is unprotected. Why isn't there some sort of gate or bar around it that could help prevent people from stepping off it? One of my former students said that he knew someone who would delight in compromising history and would just push people off the path or deliberately step off it himself so that he could claim that he changed the course of history. There's also just a possibility of tripping and falling off the path. It seems as though there would be greater measures taken by a company who admits that they're unsure of what impact they may have, but know that it could be very great. And finally, you should think about what it means metaphorically to step off or stay on the path. In addition, you probably noticed how many questions Eccles has to ask before and during passage. He knows virtually nothing about this endeavor. You have to wonder if Eccles would have gotten much or any of this essential information if he hadn't posed the questions first. So ultimately, whose fault is this, Eccles or Time Safaris? As the company, they know far more than the client. It seems as though it would be their responsibility to provide the client with as much information as possible so that the client could make the most informed decision. But regardless, this important information is imparted to Eccles nevertheless. And what is the first thing he does when he gets to the past? He playfully aims his gun. And when he's chastised, he doesn't apologize or show any shame, regret, or embarrassment. He simply says, where's our dinosaur? Now, this all changes when Eccles is immediately humbled and frightened upon seeing the T-Rex. Bradbury's description of the great beast is remarkable and beautiful and deserves a second and maybe a third reading. Truly, I mean, it really stands out as one of the great passages of literature, in my opinion. This is reality, and Eccles is no match for it. He is immediately frightened and humbled, declaring that the T-Rex can't be killed, and he wants out, and he runs back to the time machine and off the path. Obviously, Travis is angry, but Eccles ultimately brushes off the impact of his actions, saying, just ran off the path, that's all, a little mud on my shoes. What do you want me to do, get down and pray? I'm innocent, I've done nothing. But when they return, there's clearly a molecular difference. Everything is the same, but it isn't. Deutscher has won the presidency. Clearly, the people who have voted him in have different values than the ones who voted in Keith. The spelling of the English language is a little different. Nothing is the same. Eccles looks down at his shoe and he sees that he's crushed a butterfly whose death has changed the course of history. And who really knows what has actually changed? I mean, Eccles hasn't even left the office. Of course, Eccles wants a do-over. He wants to go back. He'll pay $100,000. He'll make it all better. But this is impossible. This is the one time his money can't buy him out of a dilemma. Suddenly, he hears Travis shift his rifle, click the safety catch, 
and raise the weapon. And then there's a sound of thunder. Now, readers tend to debate over whether or not Travis should have shot Eccles. After all, Travis and his company are certainly culpable in all of this as well. But I have a different theory. I think Travis doesn't shoot Eccles at all. I think the reason he raises his weapon is because there's a sound of thunder. Think about it. What is always associated with the phrase, a sound of thunder in the story? The T-Rex. Let me read you a few quotes that show you this association. We're told that the monster roared, teeth glittering with sun, the rifles cracked again, their sound was lost in shriek and lizard thunder. Suddenly it all ceased as if someone had shut the door. Silence, a sound of thunder. Out of the mist, a hundred yards away came Tyrannosaurus Rex. The Tyrannosaurus fell, thundering, it clutched trees, pulled them with it. A fount of blood spurted from its throat. Somewhere inside, a sack of fluids burst. Sickening gushes drenched the hunters. They stood red and glistening. The thunder faded. Considering these associations, it seems that Eccles, having crushed that butterfly, created a series of events that prevented the extinction of dinosaurs. And now, in this new present, humans and dinosaurs coexist. So perhaps Travis is aiming at the T-Rex that is about to infiltrate the office. I mean, shooting Eccles won't really make a difference. It's not going to make anything go away. It's kind of pointless to do so, and it really doesn't do much for the story. And I also don't think that we would be all that invested in his death. It's much more compelling, interesting, and shocking to think that killing this one butterfly led to humans living with dinosaurs, with tyrants. You'll notice that Bradbury lists a number of historical tyrants, like Caesar, Hitler, Alexander, Napoleon, Deutscher, the T-Rex. No matter how you look at it, living with dinosaurs is really no good. Let me know in the comment section below what you think a sound of thunder means, and let me know what you think of my more controversial interpretation of the phrase. Whatever the case, whatever impact this video may have on you long term, I hope it is very, very positive. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope to see you guys in the next lecture. Bye.